Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 48 of our series on libraries and recovery. Uh, started as what is a library if the building is closed over a year ago with the pandemic uh, declaration last March and have had enough interest and certainly enough things to talk about uh, in that context ever since. So we've done these nearly every week for over a year now. And uh, so today we have a really a very relevant and super interesting topic and some great examples of this uh, telehealth. Um, we usually do a little longer intro. I'm going to try to keep this short because we have a packed program for you today. <laughs> so we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. My name's Don Means, and um, uh, we're producing these. Uh, in partnership with the uh, International Federation of Library Associations Institutions, IFLA.org, out of The Hague in Netherlands, our, our longtime partner in uh, a campaign for universal public access. For a lot of people that don't have access to the internet would benefit from having it, but just, you know, for one reason or another, the infrastructure isn't there, they can't afford it. But uh, the library model, as ever, uh, seems to work for almost everybody, that uh, a community can pool resources and then share them. And internet is one of those. An individual book is another example. Whatever that might, it might be a chainsaw or uh, whatever. The libraries have this incredible latitude of, of uh, activities that they can do, whatever their community wants them, typically. Um, our session sponsor again today is Kelly Dry Warren, uh, LLP, a, a leading law firm in DC, based in DC that has been very helpful in, uh, uh, in dealing with uh, FCC changes to especially the E-rate and the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Uh, Stephen Augustino has, uh, uh, has been on and, and, and offered to provide support to anybody uh, and it is this interested in filing and taking advantage of the ECF, which is, well, I won't go into that again, but you know, this is $7 billion to connect patrons and students, which is a lot of money, but you know, it's actually not enough to do that job. So here we are uh, with getting telehealthy at the library. Uh, as you see, we have a record number of uh, speakers today, and we're going to get right to it. Uh, we're going to skip the COVID report, but everybody I think is paying attention. It's very interesting. Uh, there's both good news and ambiguous news and maybe bad news, especially if you're looking at places like India and Brazil. Um, but the topic today, we're going to get right to it here. I thought I would look up a definition of, of uh, telehealth, and this one seems pretty straightforward. And and actually a pretty simple definition. The implementation, though, I'm sure you will all appreciate is not so simple, uh, but uh, it, people people turn to the library if, if they don't know where else to go, they just do. And when times are tough, they do so even more. So this is another one where libraries are called on to support people who have needs to interact with healthcare professionals and in a lot of different ways. I was looking more into this and, and there's a, a, quite a list of activities that, that seem to fit with the library environment to support uh, patients uh, in dealing with their health providers. So with that, I will stop sharing again. So, uh, Let's move on to uh, our first speaker of the day is uh, Annie Norman, the uh, state librarian from Delaware. Uh, we've known Annie for a long time. We got involved in a, in a project, I don't know how many years ago now, Annie, uh, uh, five, six, maybe seven years ago uh, using TV white space. It had kind of mixed results. It was you know, early stage technology, but that's what we've, uh, as gigabit libraries have been uh, doing is looking to explore early stage technologies that libraries can use. 
So maybe telehealth is another one of those, but it seems like an automatic, and I suspect a lot of libraries have been doing something like this for a while. So uh, welcome, Annie. Great to see you. Uh, well, I don't see you. Uh, I see a presentation, but that's okay. But welcome, and uh, take us away. Great. Thank you, Don. Yeah, it's great to be connected with you again. You, you do great things, and I'm delighted to be here. So uh, my role today is to set the stage about Delaware Libraries and then to introduce Nick Martin. So uh, Delaware Libraries have built a powerful, seamless infrastructure of buildings and technology. We're really proud of the fact that this uh, state pays up to 50% for library construction and it pays 100% for library technologies. Uh, and that includes the Delaware Library Network. All our libraries are at one gig. Uh, we have uh, public access computing, the wireless, Wi-Fi, tech support, uh, as well as a statewide catalog, online calendar, and much, much more. Um, so we, uh, as Don mentioned, we have experimented with Don Means on, um, on white spaces. And that was a number of years ago. That was with my IT team. Uh, when I have a fantastic IT team, Ben Sauceline's the lead on that. Uh, Ed on that team uh, was testing the white spaces uh, that uh, Don mentioned uh, where he was testing it in a rural area and was threatened by a guy with a shotgun. Like, what are you up to? <laughs> so, I mean, they put their lives on the line for some of this experimentation. Uh, but the difference now is uh, our emerging tech and social innovation teams. We have additional capacity now. We have more help and expertise to build on the power of this library infrastructure with partnerships and services. So Nick Martin is our emerging technology and telehealth consultant for the Delaware Division of Libraries. Nick serves on our social innovation team, which is led by Alta Porterfield. The team includes consultants and AmeriCorps VISTAs who expand our capacity and expertise to develop new partnerships and initiatives on behalf of Delaware Libraries. Nick has a degree in chemical engineering from the University of Delaware, research experience in renewable energy technology, and professional experience in technology-centered startups. For this project, he received certification as an advanced telehealth coordinator from the University of Delaware. Nick is also a recent graduate of Leadership Delaware, and we appreciate those contacts as well. We are fortunate to have Nick's expertise to develop this telehealth initiative. Take it away, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Annie. So um, the topic of my presentation will be teleservices because um, this is sort of the umbrella term we're using to describe this initiative we're launching that includes device access, telehealth, uh, social service appointments, and more. So to sort of set the stage here, um, and I'm a data guy, as Andy described, background in engineering, I'm looking at statistics and data. And this map came up actually when I was taking that telehealth certification course. And it's data put out by our uh, Department of Health and Social Services. And there's a clear lack of mental health specialists in certain parts of our state. And you'll see those by the white, yellow, um, and green, and light blues. So Sussex County, which is our lowest county here in particular, is, is heaviest hit by this. So when I was first considering telehealth, there was a focus on telebehavioral health just by the uh, sheer lack of mental health specialists. But we also in Delaware and nationwide have an increase in depression rates and drug overdose rates. Um, and a lot of the same demographic that is experiencing this epidemic is frequenting the libraries. So taking that into account, taking the mental health specialist shortage into account, and then this device access shortage um, this, this data I have here is for Sussex County, which again is our lowest, um, most rural county in Delaware. It's reported in the most recent census that about 16% lack access to the internet and about 10% uh, do not have a device in their home. And then lastly, I found this interesting. This is um, some data from a Pew research poll. 87% of respondents from this poll 
affirm that libraries are at least somewhat useful in seeking health information. So we know that people are frequenting the libraries and in particular uh, using it to seek healthcare information. I have this graphic over here on the right here as well. Um, the De uh, Delaware libraries were featured in the September 2020 issue of the Delaware Journal of Public Health. Um, just to show that the synergy that exists between our public libraries and public health. And then at this point, I'm going to actually turn it over to a PSA we created um, that relates to this initiative. Hi, I'm Nick Martin, Program Director for the Telehealth and Device Learning Initiative with the Delaware Libraries. This program started several years ago, actually, when I came on board as an AmeriCorps VISTA with the Delaware Division of Libraries. And at that time, my focus was on emerging technology as a whole. This includes artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and as it relates to today, telehealth. But what I quickly realized was most of the needs came in terms of healthcare access. We have, as a library system, a strong partnership with the Department of Health and Social Services and Prior to COVID, we had social workers in almost all of our libraries. And my next step was to actually travel to almost all the public libraries in the state and talk with the managers about what telehealth could look like in our libraries. Little did I know that a few months after that roadshow, we would enter into a global pandemic that really highlighted the importance of quality healthcare and broadband access. What we realized next is we needed private spaces in the libraries. And since the libraries are so heavily used, including the study spaces, we needed standalone spots where patrons could frequent to access these basic health and human services. So that's how the telehealth kiosk came to be. As it stands today, the kiosks can hold two to three people inside, have HEPA filtration, UV sanitation, and are equipped with iPads and can access a variety of platforms, including Skype, FaceTime, Zoom, and several telehealth specific platforms. In addition to the kiosks, we also hired staff that we're calling navigators, who are people to assist patrons in all parts of the kiosk process. And that includes scheduling, assistance with the technology inside, and also the follow-up in the case management of um, each patron's specific needs. Hello, my name is Maria. I am a navigator at the Seifer Library. I am located next to the kiosk. We offer Chromebooks, MiFi's, and services for social service. I help with scheduling appointments. You can walk into one of the three libraries or you can go on the website, getconnected.delawarelibraries.org. All right, it never gets easier seeing your face on screen. And I promise I don't only wear black, but I guess it's a coincidence. Oh, I don't want to play that again. So in summary, um, the question that I posed when looking at this initiative was, how can we continue to meet the needs of our patrons during COVID-19 and beyond? And you already saw most of that in, in the, the PSA there. The first are the social service booths or social service kiosks. Um, so we, we use the term social service because we see these being used for a variety of things, including telehealth but uh, legal appointments, immigration support, job interviews. Um, we, we have a strong track record with providing wraparound services for our patrons. And we basically want to continue that just as at remote access points like these kiosks. Um, these kiosks are soundproof. They, like I said, they fit two to three people inside and they're connected to the high-speed internet that already exists within the public libraries. Um, as you saw in the PSA, these are currently available at three rural libraries in Sussex County at Milford Library, Laurel Library, and Seaford Library. Um, but we do have plans to extend this statewide to 15 additional libraries this summer. I say surveys here because we are, this program is grant funded and we are conscientious about how we're collecting data throughout the process. That includes um, what are patrons using the kiosks for? Is this their first time seeking health care? Um, and how is their experience? So just diving deeper into some of the features here, um, even though it is soundproof for added privacy, we have white noise machines that we hang from the outside. We have hand sanitizing stations before patrons go in and when they come out of the kiosk. Um, this is pretty unique to this setup is a UV sanitation 
light that you actually turn on for 11 minutes after a patron is done. Um, and it'll automatically turn on and off and it'll UV sanitize the booth. And then we went with an iPad, a simple setup um, that is loaded with certain social service apps on it. And the reason we went with an iPad is because there are so many different platforms that people are using. Providers have their own specific proprietary platforms, but then certain providers will use Zoom, Skype, FaceTime. Um, and this is sort of our, uh, an agnostic platform to all um, teleservices. So in addition to this, we have our device learning initiative, which is in the form of these Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, so while the kiosks are currently only at three of uh, the libraries in the state, the Chromebooks and the Wi-Fi hotspots have already been disseminated statewide. These are, can be loaned out like a library book for uh, a week at a time and up to one month, assuming there's nobody else waiting. Um, we have no late fees, but we are enforcing uh, lost or stolen items. And they come with a case and all the necessary charging cables. What um, we're being conscientious of in this initiative, though, is linking the device access to the social service access. So as I'll show in the uh, next slide, we created a new landing page that details um, how to get connected with other social services in the state. And that URL is uh, listed on all of our devices when patrons loan them. So even though they might have an issue just getting internet or device access, there might be other um, services that they need as well. And that's all available when they, when they loan this out. I should also mention that all of our do documents and all of our information is translated into Spanish and Haitian Creole, which are the three most, um, including English, the three most prominent languages in the state. And then additionally surveys here about uh, what our patrons using these devices for um, so we can report to our funders, but also continue to adapt this program to meet the needs of the patrons. So this is just a screenshot of what this new URL looks like. It's getconnected.delawarelibraries.org. And you can see it immediately will take you to device access, which is you can loan out a Chromebook or a Wi-Fi hotspot just by clicking that link. Uh, you can reserve time in one of our kiosks by clicking the middle link. And then other resources here um, is to basically refer people out to other social service uh, organizations within the state. Uh, I should mention that in order to load out a Chromebook or a Wi-Fi hotspot or to use the kiosk, you do have to have a library card. So we always link people back to that at the top right here. Uh, it's important to note that you can translate this entire page as needed. Um, uh, when you go on it. Nick? Yes. Uh, can we ask you to just pause for a second here? Uh, Diane sure. has a, a, a time requirement. We'd like to get her on, and, you know, and talk a little bit for a couple of minutes, and then we can come back and include there's a ton of questions for you. Sure. If, if we can pause here and ask Diane uh, uh, Connery from the Pospero Library to tell us what you're doing there, Diane. Welcome back. Hi. Yes, thank you. Uh, welcome to the thing that has taken over my life lately, and I am coming to you from our telehealth room. Um, it, it's an interesting how I kind of dovetail with a lot of the things Nick is talking about. Pottsboro is a rural town. We've got 2,500 people. Uh, there's no newspaper, no TV station, and we're about 30 minutes from the nearest hospital or doctor's offices. And rural communities, rural residents have lower health outcomes than people in more populated areas. So when um, the pandemic started, our library remained open throughout the whole thing simply because the lack of internet infrastructure, broad, uh, broadband is a real issue in our area. So we were getting people calling us saying, hey, my doctor wants me to have a virtual appointment. I don't have internet at home. Um, can I come in? So we had a few one-off appointments like that because we're, our building is basically, it's an old post office, it's one big room. The only private space was my office. So I would put people in my office. And then along about that time, a network of National Library of Medicine grant became available for $20,000. So um, I could wrap my head around the library side of things of how I would set it up, but I couldn't wrap my head around 
the the other end of the equation how do you not double book a room um you know and that sort of thing and luckily i connected with a a great partner it's the university of north texas health science center so two days a week tuesdays and fridays um their health care providers have appointments available for people who come here to the library so the participants call the Health Science Center, they make the appointment, they do all the payment, they take Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, private pay, um, you know, do the, the pre-check-in, all that information. And so in terms of privacy, which I know library staff, we're, you know, that's an important thing to us. All we get is the day before I'll get an email that says at 11.30 a.m. tomorrow, you will have someone coming for an appointment. And so by having one provider those two days a week, I can manage not to double book the rooms. Um, I am, as I said earlier, Don, an accidental librarian. I fly by the seat of my pants a lot of the time. And I am so fortunate that I have almost no bureaucracy. So if we have an idea here, um, we can implement it if it doesn't cost the city money, which gives us great uh, freedom to innovate. And so um, the working with these teams of people at the Health Science Center, they came up with disinfection protocols, marketing, um, just all sorts of resources of, of things that um, we use in our, in our um, system. So, so happens that we were able to make over a junk room, an old room with donated books that nobody wanted, and it has an outdoor entrance. So um, participants call the Health Science Center, make an appointment. And then at the time of the appointment, they can come in through an outside entrance, come into this private room that has soundproofing installed in it. And um, the reason, in my opinion, this is such a good fit, especially for rural libraries, we have the fastest internet connection in town. We have the staff who has digital literacy to help people as much as they need log on to the appointment make sure the lighting is right, cameras are right. Um, and, you know, people already have some hesitancy over seeing, um, a, a lot of times, seeing a doctor. And so then if you add on to that, people who aren't um, comfortable with technology, then that's another um, place of anxiety. So the fact that we as a librarian can help them feel comfortable with those, that digital need to sign on. And then if they get some news in the appointment, let's say they're diagnosed with gout, um, as, as information professionals, we are able to help them um, get to some credible resources so they can find the information they need. So I put in the chat the link to the community of practice. This is fascinating. Uh, libraries all over the country are starting this, and I want us to be able to share information about what we're doing because it's happening in a lot of, of different ways. There's some really interesting partnerships um, to be had in that. We started specifically with medical care, but we have also seen the need for um, mental health and behavioral health. So we're now um, working with someone who's going to make that, that available to us um, as well. And so I just, I think the need is there. The interesting thing I have found in our community is, uh, again, if you're talking to people who aren't tech savvy, getting them to understand what telehealth is, um, and then getting comfortable to, to come in and, and have the appointments. But this started with us basically uh, due to COVID-19, but the need is going to, to continue. And so I'm, I've got some grant proposals in the work specifically to work with 
public libraries? What do they, because in a rural system, it is going to be totally an opt-in system. So what would they need to feel comfortable facilitating these appointments? And I really do just see us as a conduit um, to the appointment. We happen to have some supplies like um, scales, blood pressure cuff, pulse oximeter, uh, thermometer, but um, the sky's the limit. A library doesn't have to have that. But just in closing, one thing I will say is when I talk to libraries in the beginning about this, um, the pushback I got was concern about infection and especially during the pandemic like we don't want to be inviting people to come to the library who are contagious and um with the the protocol we have disinfection and spacing between patrons um i feel totally comfortable saying you know that is not an issue any more than any other time most libraries get people who say hey, my kids were sent home sick from school, so I'm here to pick up books. So, you know, th that kind of thing happens. But I think all of this can be worked around and it's scalable um, no matter, you know, what size library you have. Fantastic, Diane. Uh, I'm sorry the time is so short, but uh, one thing you mentioned, which isn't perhaps obvious, at least in just thinking about it is the managing the logistics. <laughs> and so did I understand that that you've turned over scheduling to the to the health provider? You give them the window. Do you also have another they have set time and then you also have time where you can schedule and, and there won't be a conflict. That's correct. So two days a week is the health science center. They manage all of that time. And then people like me who have one-off appointments, not with that healthcare provider do um, email me at the library and I schedule them to make sure we're not double booked in this space. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it does seem like such a natural fit and, you know, it, it all in the rural circumstance, you know, just compounds the, the fact it's not news to anybody. Uh, the, but it also seems like your description and, and what we heard already from Nick and, and Annie is that uh, libraries are becoming a, uh, an integral part, if, if not an essential component of this healthcare ecosystem, this telehealth care ecosystem. And uh, that's, that's really an expensive thing to do overall. So is there any opportunity for the library to participate and, and be compensated for providing these services? Well, I would love to, to hear other input on that, but I do, yes, so often libraries get in this position of this sort of like unfunded mandates. We take on additional work without um, additional funding. And so I, I would love to see how libraries can get a piece of that. If the healthcare providers are making money on their side, then how do we um, get some of that staffing. Grants right now are fantastic. Um, there's lots of money out there for this. Um, and I will say just strategically in a small town, um, my town has a very small budget. And so I am directly competing with uh, the water lines are breaking and the firemen need a new fire truck. So strategically for us to be able to provide an essential service like this, positions us very well budget time when I go in front of city council and say I need money and it's not for story time um, it, it is for people to get the health care they need that's great that's great I know you have to go and I want to thank you so much Diane for for your story and all the work you do so uh, we'll have you. you back and we'll look for an update on this fascinating great. and please story. join the community of practice it's in the chat Okay, great. All right. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Uh, Nick, sorry uh, for the interruption, though it was a no, nice okay. kind of segue or, or example, I suppose, of an individual library and what they were facing. So um, please continue. Uh, there are, as you've seen, a number of uh, questions in the chat. Uh, we yep. can get to those at the end of your, of your presentation or uh, maybe look at them. Any, anything you want to do? Uh, let's do that in case I answer them and uh, 
through the rest of the slides. Can you uh, see my slides where I left yes. off? Wonderful. Um, so this is the landing page that has all of the resources that, that basically encompass this program. Um, the kiosk booking this, you, you can either uh, book online um, and we have time slots available. Um, you can go into your library because what's unique about our initiative is we hired staff, as you saw in the PSA, we call them navigators, and they're staff specifically located next to each kiosk to help people, the patrons in all part of the process. So you can book time through them, or you can call in and we have uh, phones specifically for the navigators that bypass the library to say, I need to book an appointment today. So I'm gonna segue a little bit out of the tech side of this, but this all sort of relates to the healthcare access point. Um, we are embarking on a very unique initiative that also relates to healthcare access that we're calling a traveling nurse program. Um, after looking at um, the number of Delawareans that are uninsured and the estimated 30,000 undocumented immigrants in Delaware, there needs to be a better way to meet the needs of these uh, communities. And oftentimes they're frequenting libraries. So I have these three libraries, I mean, these four libraries, excuse me, pulled up. They're located in the Western Sussex County, which is a most rural part of our state. And we have grant funding from Highmark Delaware to hire a nurse that will be traveling between these libraries to uh, treat basic needs of patients on a sliding scale. Um, the whole idea is to meet patrons in a space that they already frequent, um, that's not a state service center, um, a lot of people have issues with going to seek healthcare because it's uh, stigmatized in their community. Um, so this is going to be a pretty groundbreaking project as part of this larger umbrella. Now, I will say what's unique uh, about what we're doing is we really are the first statewide library-led telehealth initiative in the country. I say that because we're not working with one healthcare institution. We're actually inviting people to join us. And the reason that works out well, as you see with our collaborative partners on the left-hand side, um, the point about compensation came up for the libraries. We can now ask um, healthcare institutions to lease the space from us to use and um, to, to use the kiosks on a monthly basis. So every library becomes an originating site for telehealth and the healthcare institution will lease that space. So it provides an extra stream of revenue to uh, participating libraries. So our collaborative partners include healthcare institutions, um, technology-based nonprofits, uh, pu public private sector, um, a variety of demographics. Uh, and then we also have uh, additional conversations with other organizations, including the school district um, and, and um, school district and other uh, behavioral health centers, et cetera. So I want to include this slide because we are grant funded. This is just to get an idea of what we're looking for in terms of our outcomes. Um, the number one is just increasing access to remote health and health human services. That includes, you know, looking at the survey, seeing who's seeking mental health support for the first time, um, looking at job interview applications, people who have uh, gone through job interviews in the kiosk, um, just access to tech devices and Wi-Fi. We can look at that just by how many devices have been loaned out. Um, but we also have some interesting ways to do long-term support of people with devices um, through one of our organizations that donates refurbished laptops to people. So if people need uh, a laptop for longer than a month, we can work with them. Number three, telehealth in general is just shown to have a decreased lead time to see a healthcare provider, specifically if we can have these originating sites in, in people's public library. Um, Number four is I haven't talked about yet, but there's a lot of technology platforms that arose because of COVID um, or became more prominent. I mean, we're on Zoom, that's one of them, but also think about contactless payment, um, Instacart, Venmo, things like that, um, that the public might not be aware of. So in conjunction with all of this, we're going to start rolling out classes to increase technology knowledge and education. And then I guess last and sort of selfishly is increasing the impact of the library to the community. So while people are using these, these kiosk services or loaning out laptops, they can see the variety of other services that are available in our libraries, GED classes, 
um, story time, et cetera, yoga classes. Um, and, and we can see that by library card registrations going up and um, just people enrolling in other programs. So I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all of our sponsors. This pilot program, um, we've received over $650,000 from these sponsors to launch the kiosks and the devices. Um, and like I said, we have plans to go statewide to 15 additional libraries in the summer, but an innovative project like this could not be made possible without uh, the innovative organizations that you see on this page here. So I just want to thank all of them. And at this point, I can take questions. That's great, Nick. I, I can appreciate not acknowledging the sponsors. Um, but also, it's a, actually if you could go back a slide and 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 we could see see those uh, folks, it it might give uh, others on the call ideas about who to approach for <clears throat> for support uh, because clearly there are a lot of interests that benefit from from this kind of a service that that libraries are doing, and of course as a, as a statewide comprehensive approach, it's even more powerful. Um, this, I mean, this is a library service, but it's, you know, it is actually a new, a completely new way that healthcare is being delivered, not right. just through libraries, but in general. So it's changing a lot, and, you know, classic technology. There's a lot more convenience. It saves a lot of travel time, et cetera, that kind of thing. But when we sacrifice a little bit because we're not in person, the, the healthcare provider is not actually able to kind of lay hands on the patient and, and uh, look for specifics that they would normally do in person. But the efficiencies are so big and in, and the alternatives in a lot of cases are so small that it's, it looks like it's a, a, a permanent uh, component of, of healthcare. There were a bunch of questions yeah, uh, I was there. gonna say, yeah, you Nick, they're value? asking about the telehealth boost. Can you tell them uh, how you sure. got them and how much they cost and all that kind of stuff? And yeah. You may have to put it in chat if we're out of time. Um, I'm very fortunate to have developed a pretty good relationship with our kiosk vendor. Uh, they're called Talkbox. They're based out of Colorado and they traditionally make these kiosks for corporations who are gonna have you know private spaces inside a building to take a work call. They completely renovated this for our use case. And I'm in talks with their head of engineering to continue to iterate on what we're, we're, we're getting. They did build a, um, um, a wheelchair ramp to, to answer one of those questions specifically for us. And they're also working on a locking mechanism um, for, for the kiosk. So cost landed for each of those kiosks, and these are the bigger size ones, is about $14,000. So they're not cheap. Um, but they are state of the art in what they offer. Um, and and um, I think that answers the questions about kiosks. Well, it does on the cost, uh, but that it, it's cost on that particular model of kiosk, but are there other ways to create that kind of an environment? Yeah, so uh, there's, there's two other ways you can get, those are called the double kiosks. They're the bigger ones, the smaller ones. Um, I want our one person and there may, may be, I would say seven to 8,000. Um, but then the other option, which we're exploring with some libraries as we go statewide, is retrofitting study rooms. Some libraries have access, uh, access, excuse me, study rooms. So if you just soundproof the room, adjust the lighting, put an iPad inside, it has the same effect. We've seen this for a long time, people making international calls. I think that's the way that kind of started out, uh, uh, you know, creating a, a, a kind of an isolated, semi-isolated space. Uh, but that's just amazing. So was this uh, an idea that grew out of uh, demand? You started hearing more, you know, we're trying to accommodate these requests and we need help or, or how I didn't get, or maybe I wasn't paying attention as possible uh, when Annie set it all up and how, it, you know, the origin of the, of the program. Yeah. It's based on patient feedback. I mean, we have, as Annie said, the, the, uh, inspiration spaces or the social innovation team that I'm a part of has been around for quite some time. And we, we base our initiatives a lot on what patrons feedback is. And for us, you know, we have some of the best healthcare in our state is not necessarily located where patrons are. Um, so if you can go into your library, 
uh, and access that statewide instead of driving two hours and people don't have a car or the public transit's not there. It, it just all sort of made sense. Um, and, and leveraging the, the other, I guess, big thing is the quality of a telehealth visit depends on your connection. And um, some people think that, you know, the, these basic uh, internet packages are sufficient for a telehealth visit and maybe for an audio only, but if you want high quality audio video, you need gigabit connection like what we can offer. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, absolutely. And, and that, of course, does not exist everywhere. And the more rural the facilities, the less likely it is to exist. Uh, yet another reason for the FCC to fulfill their promise, now nearly 10 years old, to deliver uh, gigabit connectivity to all public libraries. Yeah. Um, uh, a question about UV. I mean, that's a really interesting way to sanitize. Is there a safety mechanism so it just doesn't come on, you know, when somebody's in there? Yeah, as soon as you open the door, it turns itself off. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, that's helpful, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I'm looking for other questions. Uh, well, well, we'll come back. Uh, We'll, we'll go over to Craig now and and maybe we'll open it up for you know all questions here after after we hear Craig's uh, presentation. Craig has just released Craig settles uh, has just released a guide. Shh, the doctor is in very clever Craig, shh, which is you know kind of the quintessential librarian uh, <laughs> admonition. Uh, welcome Craig. Uh, Tell us about Thank the guy. Tell us what you're doing. Craig is a longtime advocate for connectivity in, in, in libraries. And, and so, Craig, uh, what's up? Thank you. So, the guide was the end result of a conversation or an interview, actually, with Diane back in October. And the one thing that she said was that there are lots of libraries that are calling her up. And so, um, they have they they are interested, but they don't know how to start. And so I decided that well, why don't I just write a guide? Um, it's a twenty-two page or so. It's not very long, um, but I look at a, a number of things: um, partnerships, uh, the needs analysis. That's like key to me. Um, uh, there's a little section on how to market your grant proposal. Um, and then there are examples from libraries that either are doing telehealth in full or they have done elements of it before the, the pandemic and they're hoping to get back to it pretty soon. So that's the, the guide. I think a lot of questions people have are there. And then obviously, um, you know, you can lose that, uh, send me an email and then get additional information. But that's the, the starting point. And in fact, I want to talk from the point of the uh, partnerships, because I think that's a very key element um, for the success of telehealth in the library, right? So um, first off, you're, you're main, one, of your, one, one of your main partners are uh, some sort of healthcare provider, right? You can go local, and ask your neighborhood uh, family practice. Uh, for example, there's a, um, a group called the Neighborhood Family Practice. Uh, there are five, six um, uh, uh, offices. They got um, uh, FCC funding for telehealth specifically, and they would be a, a, an ideal type of partner for the healthcare side. Um, you can also obviously go to uh, the, uh, the county or city um, health department, and that might be your, you know, your ideal, you know, after you don't go, after looking at um, the, the family practices, you can also contact and partner with a clinic or a hospital. And there are various benefits for each, and you may want to, you know, weigh out all of those benefits before you actually go forward. And then you can also have several um, uh, partnerships 
Um, one of the things I thought about and added sort of at the last minute in the guide is um, partnerships with specialists, dermatologists, uh, cardio folks. Um, if you have uh, in the needs assessment, figure out that there are um, a number of uh, people that have diabetes or hypertension or so forth, you can then also look at um, partnerships with specialists to maybe have a day that is going to be just your dermatology day. And those are the kinds of uh, appointments that you guys set up. So you have all kinds of options for, for doing that. Um, the second, uh, I guess, big thing is uh, the technology. Right, you um, if you don't have a gig network, if you don't have uh, uh, an IT staff, more than one person, um, it is possible to get um, a partnership established with the companies that are in the business. All right, they can become your outsourced IT. Um, uh, operation, right? Uh, the, the sponsor for my guide uh, is Eat and A, and they are specialized in helping uh, provide IT assistance for library schools and um, small clinics and healthcare providers. Um, a lot of the, if, if it's an A track where the FCC sends money, so, um, and, and so, but there are others. I obviously, I um, definitely advocate for wireless ISPs, for especially in the rural areas, uh, because again, uh, if you talk to Diane, she has nothing but great things to say about their um, uh, WISP, because the nature of WISP is that they are very much focused on the service of the community. And in cases where, you know, we're talking about the library, uh, they'll help like for, for uh, in, in um, um, Diane's case, right? The, they have um, uh, hotspots that are provided from the WISP. Uh, they've been able to uh, do a number of um, innovative things of, uh, with the library, with their WISP in, you know, in partnership. Uh, um, rural, uh, urban areas do not have as many WISP. However, they are very valuable in the places that have them. And I even recommend that some of these WISP that are, you know, relatively close to urban areas uh, look at providing services. And again, the, you know, partnering with the library would be a great starting point for a WISP that's coming into a, or expanding in a uh, urban setting. So I'm big about that. Um, I think that the uh, TV white space is, um, you know, it is evolving technology, but I think it is, would be very beneficial for the library, especially for telehealth, being able to provide services, uh, broadband services from a distance. So I think that that's uh, uh, something to definitely look at as well. Um, uh, the other thing is um, ENA, and I think there are several other companies are trying to figure out how to make um, the hotspots non dependent on cellular companies. Because right now, I mean, that's basically where a lot of the, the uh, portable hotspots got started is that there were deals with uh, Sprint or T-Mobile, and I forgot who bought, bought who, but um, you know, the, the upside is that you could bring in the hotspot, uh, you know, send the patron home with that. And if they have good access to um, cellular, uh, well, those two in particular, um, then, then you're fine. If you go to the rural areas, it's harder to find that kind of um, access. So uh, ENA is working on um, a technology 
that would allow hotspots to work regardless of the broadband source. So I think that that's where uh, I think where we're going because the hotspots are, 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 are stellar. They are stellar technology, right? But the limitation is the link, the requirement that you be um, part of the um, network, uh, the cellular network. So if you can bring technology that that re, that frees the um, uh, the uh, hotspots from that limitation, that's a big win for everybody. So uh, I think that's a that's a that's a good way to look. Um, the thing, last thing, is I want to look at is the community institutions, right? Um, a lot of who libraries serve are low-income communities, uh, immigrant communities, seniors, um, uh, very, uh, communities of color, and so forth. And um, so when you want to partner and expand your telehealth services from the library to the community, right? There are things, options that, such as um, partnering, partnering with barbershops and hairdressers, right? That would be allow, uh, would allow them to uh, do services such as take uh, blood pressure readings, uh, provide just general information on different um, you know, treatments for different um, situations, uh, doing uh, wellness um, programs and so forth, where the barbershops and the hairdressers uh, provide the initial customer contact and the library provides information you know, access to databases and so forth. And that's like a permit of a perfect example of a partnership that would work, right? There's a group called um, Libraries Without Borders and they have um, uh, services that they put, uh, put together in partnership with libraries that bring uh, both the library and telehealth to the laundromat. I mean, that's just like, that's like wild to me, um, but they, they figured out how to make it work, right? So this um, partnerships with um, barbershops, laundromats, hair salons, churches is another one. I mean, if you wanna reach the, um, you know, the black community, the Hispanic communities, uh, you go to church on Sunday and that's where you have, uh, and they're already, predisposed to the concept of telehealth because that's that's what churches do and they have space they have rooms they have um you know other resources that they can bring to uh the table uh supermarkets um they're in salt lake city they've their library has been very successful working with supermarkets uh that cater to um, people from Mexico, um, Central America, and uh, but that's where people are. That's where you need to be with telehealth. And you can do that with all the different technologies that you have. So in, um, conclu in a conclusion, uh, first, get the guide. Um, it will be extremely valuable to form your strategy, your proposal, uh, you know, you know um, uh, how, how to form your partnerships. Uh, there, there's a lot, there's a, um, a um, doctor that I interviewed that talked about, you know, how to set up the structure between the library and a uh, healthcare professional. So it's, uh, it's a good document. I mean, I am biased, true, but it's a good place to, to start right now. Um, I think that'll, that'll be it. I know the Australians need to get a little time in there as well. And I'm really excited to see, I've been in Australia in, a, in about a decade or so, so I definitely would know what they, what they have going on. Great, Craig. Um, the guide is so timely as so much of your work is. And uh, a, a nod to ENA, who's really been uh, 
a mover in the connectivity space, I guess we could say. Uh, your idea, uh, your notion of, of expanded partnerships, it, it, it makes the point that, you know, this is as a distributed delivery system, it's really unlimited almost. I, I can imagine the churches are great, great environments to, for both awareness, which is a key part of all this, that it even exists. Well, a lot of people have no awareness of this uh, as even a thing or where they could find it uh, as their providers ask them to find something somewhere. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's remarkable. The, we've, uh, we've spent a lot of time here uh, because this is such a massive topic uh, that uh, we've just on the fly decided we're gonna do a follow-up special session next Thursday. So we're not gonna try to uh, cram uh, uh, the Australian video in here in the last few minutes of our session today, but uh, you know, mark your calendar. We'll send out the notice, of course, and we'll do this uh, a special session, a part two session on uh, the coming Thursday. Uh, next Friday, just to add a plug for that, we're going to have two extraordinary uh, presenters, one uh, on uh, infrastructure, the kind of the macro scale thinking that that libraries need to understand the context that, that we're all kind of in. Uh, and also we're gonna have uh, a library professor from China will present uh, a fascinating story on how they're doing home libraries or what they call neighborhood libraries, but it means actually a, an actual library curated selection that people, that go in people's homes. So that's gonna be really interesting. So let's take the rest of the time here for some additional Q&A or other comments. Uh, uh, Nick, if you've been tracking or Annie been tracking the questions, if there's anything you've seen you'd want to weigh in on. Uh, uh, and Craig, thanks for mentioning the WISPs. Uh, they are really valuable. They're, they're a different kind of provider. Uh, these wireless internet service providers, they are invariably community-based and have a kind of a different set of motivations. Uh, the one that uh, that Diane is partnered with that we were able to support uh, with uh, an award, an IMLS award under our second NEST program is using uh, educational uh, broadband services spectrum. EBS, which are licensed to the area school districts and community colleges, and then sub licensed to the WISP, who then, in partnership with the area schools, has set up um, uh, uh, neighborhood access stations. Now, these are not these are not uh, these healthcare kiosks that we've seen and talked about today. These are just open uh, access points that are conveniently located in neighborhoods where people can go. You know, even if they they don't have a car, they someplace close enough to walk, which is our our mantra that everyone should be within easy access of a uh, of a library access station for all the different needs that that people have, and uh, uh, and, and the WISP was already doing that to connect students at home, which is uh, a point that I think Craig just made there at the end related to schools as a, another partner, and it would seem like schools would have the same kind of motivations to offer these kinds of uh, services. Um, and sounds like they would make a good partner in working through a lot of the logistical and technical issues. Is, has that been your experience, Craig or Annie? Have you, and Nick, have you worked with school districts around the state to set these up? I haven't uh, worked with school districts but I know that um, all of the libraries that I interviewed for the um, guide spoke fair favorably of li um, schools as a, uh, as, as a partner. So I would say yes, both from a, I uh, think in, in uh, Wisconsin and a number of places, they have a agreement set up where the um, the schools apply for uh, uh, E-rate money and the libraries 
can just send a one page memo to, to carry on or to go with them. So, right. um, and, I, and so the guy, Bob, Bob, Bob Botcher said that um, there are other states that are probably doing the same thing. So yes, the schools are truly a good starting point as well for partnerships uh, because yeah. of the nature of the synergy. Yeah, the the, yeah. the synergy. Uh, schools have not been a good partner for us. That is not part of our success really? story. Hope springs eternal. Oh. But uh, yeah, we're under Department of State <laughs> and schools are under uh, DOE, of course. And um, so um, we do have better connections than we ever have before under this current administration, the Kearney administration. Uh, but we're, uh, that's, I think, mostly because we launched Dolly Parton's Imagination Library, which is super popular but not, um, not on the health issues yet. So, um, but that's a good thought. Maybe Nick can, maybe we can get Nick to work on that. <laughs> this is classic, Annie. This is absolutely <laughs> classic that, that we see that, that libraries and schools, both educational institutions have almost no actual interactions. And it's, it's just a tragedy, uh, but you know, the, the institutions are very different. They're governed and financed very differently and yet they have a, a huge overlap of, of patrons. And well, and even overdrive, I, I, you know, I, I talked with the CEO, but, you know, we have a statewide overdrive collection and they just started another one, a uh, separate one for schools. Classic, um, classic. Yeah. Hey, Don, right. I, can, I, I can actually weigh in on that um, sure. because, because it has come up. And, you know, a, lo a lot of times after school, if the library's by the school, you're going to have a lot of kids in the, in, in the library. Um, and this really came up from a behavioral health perspective. Um, the issue you, you run into is frankly, how can they be seen um, um, and they need parent or guardian consent? And what if the parent or guardian is the issue, right? Um, and the reason they get away with it in the schools is because they'll, they'll sign away the parent or guardian to access the health center, which includes a variety of supports, including behavioral health. So what we're looking at and exploring with the Children's Hospital in Delaware is ways that if, if um, under 18, I think there's certain federal policies, 13 to 18, if you really need to be seen for therapy, you can actually um, um, consent for yourself to be seen. So, you know, we, we are looking for ways to expand our services to definitely teenagers in the library. Interesting, yeah, the, the permissions. I mean, this is such a complex area as we know from the, you know, the whole record security standpoint and permissions. So obviously a massive topic and obviously a, a justification to have a follow on session next week to just get a little bit more uh, uh, deep into this uh, incredible uh, topic. And we are at our hour here uh, we're not totally fixed on being 60 minutes. This is not a TV program, but we do like to, you know, try to uh, take care of people's schedules because a lot of people are scheduling to do something else at the hour. Um, but uh, I'm going to ask for kind of final thoughts here and we'll close a recorded session. We'll kind of hang around for some chat, but we don't want to take up too much of the information that we want to record next Thursday. So, uh, Craig, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to you for a last thought here, and then uh, we'll go to Nick and Annie. I think that we're at the, uh, a very important and crucial area, which is telehealth, and that libraries can make a main, uh, be a main driver of telehealth, because if you look at the history of libraries, and broadband, right? We have uh, a lot to thank libraries for in terms of awareness, uh, access, um, and adoption, right? And so I expect that the same will hold true for telehealth. That the libraries are a, a, a um, you know, that's like the first go-to partnership i think and so i think that that's where we are is like on the on the cusp of libraries becoming like this vanguard of telehealth deployment 
Yeah, great, Greg. We, we started referring to libraries as the Swiss army knife of public institutions. <laughs> Everything, you know, that anybody wants that they don't know how to do, they turn to the library and the library since <laughs> always say yes. Uh, Nick, last word. Yeah, I would say um, coming from my startup background, I'm used to pivoting. And one thing I can say for this project in, in telehealth and with any library project is it's okay if it doesn't work out in the beginning the way you want it to. And it's important to continue to pivot um, and have innovative people on your team and partners who are innovative too. Um, I think that's the only reason this is grown as successfully as it is, is because we have people who adapt to continue to uh, make this program succeed. Great point. A great, a great general point as well that, uh, you know, you have to have a plan just to start anything, but you can't get too attached to it because the likelihood that it's, that you've built it on some kind of faulty assumption is, is highly likely. And you do need to be flexible and ready to uh, change uh, in the face of experience. Uh, Annie, we're going to give you last, very last word today. And, and, and what kind of call to action can you, can you leave us with as well? Well, uh, Noah, I see Noah's here. He's been commenting in the chat about partnerships. And so uh, I think my final word is about collective impact. It's a, an ALA of, of Library of the Future trend is collective impact. Uh, we're part of, uh, we've joined the National Communities of Excellence Initiative. We're the only library so far, hint, hint. Um, and I think that as Noah is saying, partnerships are key. And, it's helping us with the funding. It's helping us with the expertise. And, um, and so that's my final word, other than thank you, Nick. He's doing a fantastic job. And thank you, Don, for um, inviting us today. Well, absolutely my pleasure. And while there is a lot to talk about, we will pick this up. Uh, and a lot of these questions we'll try to get to next week uh, and next Thursday. Keep an eye out for a, a notice of it. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute. Could you unmute, please, everyone? Because if we were together in a room and we had these extraordinary presentations, we'd be giving these people a round of applause. And that's what we'd like to do right now. Give it to you. Thank you very much. That's great. That's great. OK. Well, with that, I very much. Close the recording now. Thank you. I have 